This is a gas tube full of hydrogen. Luckily, I've got a portable Tesla coil right here, and I'm gonna turn that sucker on and show you what this thing can do. Look at this, watch this. See that? It can light up. Can you tell that that's lighting up? It's lighting up a beautiful purple. Guess you can't really tell, but you kinda can. All right, it's flashing, lighting up. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is first unplug this thing. Second, I'm gonna tell you that this diffuse gas here, it's a very low pressure gas, it's about as different from a black body as we can possibly get. So I wanna to talk to you about the spectrum that comes out of a black body. We'll leave that right there that, so that you consider, can consider it. So we'll go purple and we'll say the spectrum of a black body, this would be like intensity as a function of frequency. And so you find that you get some spectrum and then there are no really high frequency um, waves coming out of there and no really low frequency waves coming out of there. It just looks kind of like this. This is a black body. And black bodies are solids. Black bodies, well, a black body has all the electrons in kind of an electron soup and they're hanging out in a solid and every atom is right next to every other atom. So if one atom starts going really fast, it might bump into another atom that's going really slowly and you've got this distribution. It's really a probability distribution of speeds of the molecules of the solid and it's, uh, it's really statistical and random and spread out like this. I'm gonna say distribution of velocities and distribution of energies and it's just a distribution of a mess over here. This is in great contrast to the intensity graph that you would see, let's see, intensity versus frequency for a, uh, let's call it a low pressure gas. By low pressure, I just mean it's diffuse. There's very little gas inside of this, this um, tube of glass right here in a low pressure gas, well, this is what's really interesting. It's going to be different colors, and um, I, I just propose that we might see something here, and we might see something here, and we might see something here. And in terms of like looking at it, you'd probably just see a color, a color, and another color. And you know the way that we can spread out a light that we see? Based on frequency, we just use a diffraction grating. So what I'm about to do is I'm about to take this tube right here full of very, very little hydrogen, it's mostly vacuum in there, and I'll put it in this power supply right here which is simply going to cause the hydrogen to become excited. And the hydrogen, when it's excited, it lets out light. I'm gonna run a voltage through the hydrogen and the hydrogen will glow. So this is exactly the same technology that's used in neon lamps and we're gonna seek to understand it today. It is, uh, it is absolutely fascinating. Turns out it can actually tell us about the structure of an atom. So, here we go. So there's this glowing tube of hydrogen gas in here, and we've just got a high voltage, uh, high frequency power supply here, and this is a diffraction grating. And notice you see something really interesting when you look in the diffraction gating. I'm looking right there, so there's a red light here. I think that means that that red light is coming from this gas, hitting the diffraction grating, and then diffracting, bending right there to go straight into the camera. So let's look at that a little bit more carefully. First of all, if you look at, through the diffraction grating at the gas, you see nothing interesting at all. You just see the gas. But if you look over here a little bit, you start to see the gas repeating itself, and you see some primary colors, some like really, really principal strong colors, and you don't see any colors in like the green and the yellow. I don't see an image of that gas in the green or the yellow. I see a very strong blue and then a really interesting bluish, whitish, greenish almost thing, and then a red. And uh, these spectra, I mean, that's a signature spectra of hydrogen. I can't fake that with uh, gas of krypton or anything. So let's get into this and figure out what the heck's going on. So now let me take you back to the 1880s. It had been known for a while that when you excited hydrogen, now this is just atomic hydrogen right here, atomic, or maybe it's H2, I don't even know. So hydrogen in a diffuse gas is going to make this pattern right here. When you look at it, you'll see these particular lights. I think you see primarily just these four wavelengths of light, um, you know, 410 or something, 450, 490, and 650 or so. So 
you see these and they had diffraction grating so they could know where these were and they'd done all the angle calculations. 1880s though, there's no explanation for this. In fact, there's not even a pattern. And in the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest triumph of a school teacher ever. I mean, school teachers are all about, you know, saving the world and changing the lives of kids and making a difference. But this school teacher, this school teacher did some real physics and that's awesome. His name was Balmer and he lived in Switzerland and he had no formal mathematical training. He was just a school teacher. Awesome. He discovered a relationship between these four lines and in fact it applied to some other things as well, but he decided that he could explain it by 1 over lambda equals some number that he was able to write down and then he took 1 over 2 squared. Why didn't he write it as 1 over 4? I don't know. I guess we'll find out later. And then he subtracted 1 over n squared. And it wasn't just any integer. It wasn't just any whole number. n had to be 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or something else. Of course, these things eventually aren't able to be seen, but you notice these lines are getting closer and closer together. That's, uh, that's a very interesting pattern that's a function of this series here. It was called the Balmer series. He defined that letter ARA as the Rydberg constant, and he said ARA is 1.097 times 10 to the seventh inverse meters. Let's see if we have one over meters here. It's going to be, oh yeah, of course it should be one over meters because this is one over the wavelength. Okay, but the cool thing is it's totally like Kepler. Kepler comes up with this weird um, relationship between period and radius of a planetary orbit, and he has no idea what he's doing. Similar with Balmer, although having this pattern let people try to figure out why the pattern worked, and that's process of physics that's perfectly awesome. Kepler, Balmer, meaningful contributions to physics because they give us a framework for our understanding, and our theory then has to explain why this happened. So we'll get there soon, but I just want to celebrate Balmer for a little bit. I want to say that if we plug in n equals 5, then we get 1 over the wavelength for the fifth Balmer line. What is it, the third Balmer line? I don't even know what you'd call this. This is going to be aura times 1 over 4 minus 1 over 25. And if you do that math with that and that and that, then you get some wavelength, which turns out to be, oh, sorry, I'm not going to give you the 1 over the wavelength. I'm going to give the wavelength, which is 4.341 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. 431.1 nanometers. So that must be that line right there. So this is n equals two, oh sorry, n equals three, n equals four, n equals five, n equals six, and they're getting closer and closer together here, but pretty soon you can't see it because your eyes can't see beyond the violet. That's why we call it ultraviolet. I, let's explain why in a little bit, but not today.